Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Will you stand with me? The first song that we're singing today is taken, I love to sing the Word of God, and it's taken from the scriptures of Psalms 92. I'm going to read the first five verses. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, with harmonious sound. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. Oh, Lord, how great are your works. Amen. Let's worship the Lord today. Your love in the 
our brothers and sisters from Gracia de Dios. So we'll sing this in English, then we'll sing it in Spanish, all right?
worship is not something we do just to get out of the way so then somebody can speak a few minutes. Worship is the most powerful force in the earth today. And I'm going to tell you why. When we praise God, we enter His presence. When we worship God, He enters our presence. Now, if, if you're religious, you're not going to like me at all. Okay, because God's not religious. God's into relationship. And if you're into programs, you might as well just leave now because I don't have a program. I pray in tongues and I ask the Spirit of God to tell me what to say everywhere. And I minister, you know, a lot. I ask the worship people to stay here because they're not finished yet. Because when, when they hit about the third time on I Speak Jesus, the Spirit of God leaped on the inside of me and said, go do what I instruct you to do. So here's what I'm going to tell you. This morning, can, you can walk out the same way you walked in, or you can, I can walk out totally transformed by the power of God. But God's not going to twist your arm and make you do anything. God gives us an invitation to enter into his presence with a great level of expectation, knowing that the expectation of the righteous shall be granted. I need you to follow me for a second. Come on. We can get there. I'm going to ask you to do something. Everyone in the room that can, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Because when we raise our hands, it's a universal sign of surrender that says, not my will, but mine, not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit of the living God. Go. What do you want to say now? Come on. Here's what the Lord told me. And when she did that, that was my moment. If you need God to touch your life this morning, I haven't preached a word yet. I will, but I'm gonna invite you. Keep playing, man, you're anointed. You are anointed by God, keep playing. If you need God to touch your life this morning, I'm going to invite you to come to this altar right now. But I haven't heard your message. Who cares about my message? I want the power of God. Right? So I'm going to invite you. Now, if, when you see God moving, don't come. You have one opportunity to come right now. This is it. When I say three, maybe it's healing. Maybe it's, your, maybe it's depression. Maybe you need a miracle in your body. Maybe you need financial breakthrough. Here, here's mine. Here's why I come this morning. I asked God to do something for me, and it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. And yet, I have one choice. Though he slay me, the word says, yet I will trust God. So maybe tonight, this morning, you're going through a situation and it's hard to trust God. Maybe you're just wondering, where is God? I'm telling you, he's the same place right now that he was at when you were on that mountaintop experience. Come on, I'm, I'm just telling you, he won't let me go until I give this one more time. If you know you, if that pounding you have in the center of your chest, that's not my voice. That's the Holy Ghost saying, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. darkness over 
lugares. Now then, every one of you that are down here at this altar, stand up and make me a line right here. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. I do not want to waste time. All of you, up and make this line right here. All of you. If the Lord tells me to tell you something, I will. If he doesn't, I will not. If, he, if I do tell you something, never live your life by prophecy alone. Put it on a, cha- a counter. Let God confirm it with two or three witnesses. That's how he does it. Today, I'm either sowing the seed into your life by the word, or I'm watering the seed that someone before me has already sown, but God always gives the increase, right? So this is how this works. I, you don't need me to come preach a message. You've got a preacher. You've got a pastor. Now, I'm going to share what God told me to share. Well, we don't do it this way. Come back next Sunday. You'll love it. Come back next Sunday. You'll love it. Now, let me tell you this. This is always important to say. Do not give me a courtesy fall. Don't fall. Oh, I got to fall. That's religious. I hate it. I'll spot it in a minute. If you fall, you fall. Somebody will catch you. If they don't, it's carpeted. You'll be fine. Right? Amen. Right? Just keep scooting this way. Come on. Just keep scooting. There's three people. Got, just keep. There's always room for one more. There's always room for one more. Listen, it doesn't matter if I'm standing in Thompson Bowling with 16,000 students or I'm standing here in Clinton, Tennessee with Howard. I, nothing compares to the moment when Jesus touches the hearts of people. Now, listen, I know he'll speak to me and through me because he spoke through a donkey, my wife tells me, on a regular basis. So if God will use a donkey, he'll use me. But guess what else? He'll use you, right? All I'm doing is touching and agreeing. What am I touching about? Matthew 18, 19, where two or three agree is touching anything in Jesus' name, it shall be done. Whatever you're, whatever you're here, I don't need to know that. That's between you and the Spirit of God. All I'm doing is adding my faith to whatever it is you're believing for. And in that moment, if God tells me to tell something, I will. But if not, we'll walk out of here differently because now one puts 1,000 to flight, two puts 10,000, right? Now, so far, I've probably given you, I don't know, 12 or 13 scriptures. I've not opened my Bible yet. So listen, because there's a message being preached without the Bible even being opened. Why? What's in you is coming out of you. I can spend five minutes with any one of you in this room or watching online. And if I shut up and let you talk, I'll tell you where you are spiritually within five minutes, just based on what's coming out of your mouth. Words create worlds. When God created the world, what did he do? He spoke. Then he created you and I to be just like him. Genesis 1, 27, 28. Then God said, let us create man in our own image. When God created his world by his word, then he created you to be just like him. Today, the words you speak create the world in which you live. Job 22, 28, you will also declare a thing and it will be established for you. So light will shine on your path. I'll give you an example. Well, I'm sick and tired of my job. You're probably sick and tired quite a bit. I'm scared to death. I'm going to get COVID. Get ready. I'll never have my own airplane. Enjoy driving. Well, I'm not married. Nobody wants to marry me. Stay single and put a smile on your face. When you change your words, you change your world. But God's only going to, listen, the only thing God's honor bound to respond to is his word coming out of your mouth in faith. When you give a seed, you can count on God. There's coming a harvest. That's just the law. Show me the greatest heathen in every city who's blessed beyond measure, wouldn't know God from Adam. Look at their checkbook. They're givers. Well, don't get, so you get quiet when I start talking about money. We didn't ask for, let me just tell you, our ministry's debt free. We didn't ask anybody to give us any, did we ask you for any money? Not going to. You want to give us an offering? Praise God. We thank you. We'll pray for, pray for your harvest. We live by seed time and harvest. That's why my, everything our ministry has is, is paid for. Because we've sown for it. So don't get angry when people are blessed. You sow into that, guess what? You sow, the anointing you sow into is the anointing you retract. It's just the way this works. It's all it works. See, I lost half of you when I got... We're not even talking about money. We're talking about smiling. You want to have friends? Just freak your faces out and smile. It will draw people to you. You want to to have somebody pray for you when you're not feeling well? Pray for somebody who's sick. Well, what are they going to get? Are they going to get worse because you pray for them? Well, what if they don't make it? Well, the other side of that is blissful. They're going to heaven. All right. Heaven, oh, he's going to sing here in a minute. I know he is. And then all we're doing is touching out of grain. Ooh, there's the anointing. Watch it, Joseph. Did you push her? I would never push anybody. That's so silly. It's so silly. Your Relax. name is power. Why are you here? Your name is healing. What? Your name is This is a piece, piece, this is a dear friend of mine. Pray for her. Well, she just got healed. 
serving God for how long? Most of my life. About 35, 40 years. Well, maybe, maybe a few more than that. Okay. All right. Here's what the Lord told me to tell you. You can cook, right? If you were, he said, tell her, ask her this question. If you were going to cook biscuits right now, can you tell me the three, three of the ingredients that you would use? Mm. Flour, buttermilk, All right. So if one of those ingredients were left out, it wouldn't turn out right, would it? It would be a mess. And the Holy Ghost told me to tell you that each of those ingredients are necessary, right? Yes. As are you necessary to his kingdom yeah. in Jesus' name. Ooh. 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 Did I, I didn't pray for her. I went right past you. Did I pray for you? You. Did I pray for you? I went right past you. Were you standing there right the whole time? That's interesting. You know what the Lord just told me about that? I didn't do that on purpose. He says, sometimes she's been overlooked. But today, the first shall be last, <laughs> and the last shall be first. Ooh. Look at me. I gave you three words. Embrace them. If ever I've had a word for anybody on this planet, from South Africa to South Australia to England to the Caymans to Eleuthera, on television around the world, across America, I don't know how many times, I know I heard God for you. It's important. Holy ground. Holy ground. 
I want you to make your way to your seats, but I want you to stay plugged in because I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me to tell you, then I'm going to get out of your way. may be seated. Thank you all so much. That's a gift. Thank you, drummer. You're anointed. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I was waiting for somebody to say something. My goodness. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We magnify your mighty name, Lord. Woo. We worship you, Lord. Never rush the Holy Ghost. If all we did was worship for the next 30 minutes and the pastor closed the service, that was mission accomplished. I asked the Lord what he wanted me to share with you, with a church that's embarking upon your 75th, I believe, anniversary. You know, if you knew statistically how many churches are closing every week, that's a staggering number across the country. But your church continues to be effective, whether it's feeding people, whether it's having your medical um, truck up, up above us here, whether it's just reaching the community, however it is that you do it, the effectiveness of ministry is, I believe, what God looks for. What is God going to judge us on? Not what we did. We're going to be judged on what we did as it relates to what he called us to do. 
the fruit is very important to God. I've spoken with, you know, two and a half million people at live events so far. This Tuesday at one o'clock in the afternoon, I will minister at my, for my 4,000th time. And while I'm grateful for that, I feel like I'm way behind. I feel like God has, he's pushing the accelerator in. It's why we travel the way we travel, because a couple of nights ago, I was in Ohio. Last night, I was in Chattanooga. Today, I get to be with you. Tomorrow morning, early, we hop on the airplane, and we'll be in Mississippi, and we'll be in Natchez, Mississippi, and tomorrow morning, 24 hours from now, I will have spoken at three schools by now, then about from 8 o'clock to noon. We'll then be in Louisiana. We'll get back. I'll be in Cleveland, Tennessee, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Next weekend, we're in Alabama somewhere. I mean, it's, it's, we're always going, is my point. And while I'm grateful for the opportunity to go, I'm also grateful for the opportunity to slow down and get to see people and get to talk with people and listen with people. And I've met some of you this morning, and I, 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 I want to do this. And I, and I, don't, I don't always do this because I'm not always led to, but I, I do believe strongly that the, the Lord would have me say to your pastor that you, you, while, while the, the journey has not always been easy, your faith has always met the occasion. And your faith meeting the occasion has positioned you in a place of leadership. And if your life had ended last night, you would have split heaven wide open and you would have heard the words echoing through heaven, well done, because you have been found faithful, the Lord says. I'll tell you why the Lord drew me to your pastor's heart so much, because this morning we got here a little early. Usually we, we land in our plane and somebody picks us up and I, and I get... You know, I get to the place a few minutes before I speak, and this morning it made no sense to fly. We drove up, and um, we got here early, and so I, I, I was I, I surprised, I think, the pastor. I walked into his office a little early, and he was sitting there, and he was teaching three teenage young men. And I thought, oh, okay, that's what this is. You have somebody who's interested in, in, in people, and if you're, if you're in ministry, guess what? You're in the people business. And if you're in ministry and you don't like people, if you get to heaven, that's a big if. If you get to heaven, you're, you're going to hate it because heaven's full of people, right? People say, well, I don't like it loud. You're really not going to like heaven. God's not going to call you back with a ukulele. He's going to call you back with a trumpet blast you'll hear from East L.A. to South China and all points in between. The Bible says the, the dead praise not God, neither them that go down in silence. If you're going down today, the Bible also says victory is accompanied with a shout. Give God something with which to work. Shout. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. That's why the Bible says God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. When it doesn't make any sense to shout, that's when I shout the most. I was walking across a, a, a tarmac going to the airplane one day, and there was a guy working over here on an airplane, and he was in a hangar, and he hit his hand with that hammer, and it must have really hurt, but he said everything except God bless you. I mean, he just kept going. The Holy Spirit said to me, are you going to do anything about that? And suddenly I had a shout come up on the inside of me. And I screamed the word, hallelujah. I never stopped walking. I just shouted, hallelujah. Guess what? He shut up. You know why? If you don't embarrass sin, sin will embarrass you. What you compromise to gain, you will eventually lose. Now I think so. That's why I said it. You and I have an opportunity every day to make a difference in the lives of other people. And in the world and times in which we are living, all you have to do is look to Israel, look to your Bible, and look to whatever news feed you get, and you'll see where we are. Well, I don't believe that. Well, you, you, you better. I, I was talking with a young person not long ago, and he said, I don't believe in, in hell. I said, well, guess what? You will. Unfortunately. Well, let me tell you a quick little story. I was speaking in a big high school, and it was hot. And I've spoken in schools that you've seen on television. Schools have been, they've had school shootings where kids have been shot and killed. They, they call our ministry, and we go. So I was speaking in this school, and it was, it was very hot in the gymnasium. I just finished speaking, and there were probably 1,200-plus students there. And I see this young man walking towards me, and he's got this long trench coat on, and he's walking very aggressively towards me. I'm like, Lord, you, you see this guy coming? Because, you know, we, you, in today's high school, the Lord, the Lord told me years ago, the most dangerous place I'll ever minister is in a high school. I said, Lord, you see this guy coming towards me? He said, I got you, Dino. 
I said, okay. Now, people, when I say that, they go, Dean, you mean you actually talk to God like that? And I go, you don't? How do you know what to do in life? The most important thing you and I will ever do is hear the voice of God. The second most important thing we'll ever do is obey what we heard. So this young man's walking up to me. He comes, man, I like you. I went, thank God. I like you too. He goes, I loved your assembly. I said, well, thank you. I hope you got something out of it. He said, oh, I did. He said, but you talked about God. I said, I sure did. He said, I don't believe in God. I said, cool, great. I got 45 kids over waiting to talk to me. I got to go. He grabs my arm. He goes, well, aren't you going to try to talk me into believing? I said, no, 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 no. He said, why not? Because if I could talk you into believing something today, somebody a lot better than me could talk you out of that tomorrow. So I turn, he grabs my arm a second time. He goes, well, what would happen if I die? I said, are you a Christian? He said, I just told you I don't believe in God. And that made me mad. I go, well, you're going straight to hell. Oh, I, need to, I need to preface this by saying, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> I don't have a pastoral bone in my body. Thank you. Pastors' jobs are to comfort the afflicted. My job is to afflict the comforted, and I'm anointed to do so. <laughs> I could make you mad today, but it's okay. I'm leaving. <laughs> so this young man looks at me and goes, did you, what did you, I said, let me help you, man. There's only two choices. There's heaven, there's hell. He says, well, I go to church. I said, that's wonderful, but my car goes to church. Think about this. This building is not the church. This building is a structure in which people gather as the church. But this building is, listen, I've stood on, I've stood on pews and made people so mad because they're so crazily religious. And God will have me, he's had me walk on pews before. I'm like, they're never going to have me back here. They're going to kick me out. And he said to me, they've already kicked me out. Do it. I don't want to be counted among those who have kicked God out. So this young man and I continue our conversation. And he goes, Dean, I don't know what to do. I said, listen, man, wouldn't you hate to miss heaven by 30 seconds? Do you know how many people are going to miss heaven by 30 seconds? If that doesn't stir you, you don't have to be an evangelist to be stirred. People are going to die and go straight to hell. What are you doing about it? Well, yeah, I, he's the preacher. His job is not to, to go out there and build this church. His job is to shepherd this church. I can show you right now today in this moment, in the next 25 seconds, how to double your church in seven days, and it won't, I won't, won't take any fees at all. It's a fail-proof policy. Each of you go get one. Bring them in Sunday with you. You just doubled. Well, why would we do that? Well, you self-centered people, why would you not do that? People, you know, do you think people just on the other side of the world are, are having troubles? You know the answer. People who've been through addiction, I've lived that. My wife was, was, was had a very strong addiction, and I didn't help her get through it. And I had a counselor where they asked me, said, what could you have done to help love that addiction out of her life? And I said, I didn't put the addiction in, it, in her life. And he goes, that wasn't the question I asked you at all. And it was convicting. You know, when, you know when you start winning? When you start looking to Jesus as the author and the finisher. And by the way, my wife got delivered just like that. Why? Because love never fails. So this young man continued our conversation. He goes, I don't want to go to hell. I said, let's pray. He said, right now? I said, if we don't pray right now, I said, Lord, I need 30 seconds. He said, you're serious about this? I said, oh, yeah, I'm serious about this. I prayed for that young man. He said, he said if, if we pray right now, he said, everybody's going to be looking at me. I said, dude, you're in a trench coat. It's 100 degrees where we're standing. You're talking to the speaker. I can assure you, they're already all looking. He goes, okay, let's pray. I led him to Jesus. He opened his eyes, and his eyes changed right in front of me. The Bible says the eyes are a reflection of the soul. The, the, mind, the soul is what? The mind, will, emotions. He walks off. We get him some help. I'm talking to these 35 or 40 students. They've been waiting 25 minutes. It wasn't five minutes later. That young man comes up to me. He's dragging somebody with him. The guy I just led to Jesus. He goes, Mr. Dean, this is John. He's my best friend. He's going straight to hell. <laughs> I went, John? He says, do you want me to tell you what John did last night? I said, no, I don't want that image in my head. Do not tell me anything about John's life other than John. He goes, what happened to my best friend? I said, oh, I introduced him to my best friend. He says, I want that. I said, it's not a that, it's a he. Well, I led John to Jesus. They walked off together. We got him some help. And the Holy Ghost said to me, he said, the first young man you won to me? I said, yes, sir. He said, from the foundation of time, I called him to be an evangelist. His first thought was, I got to get John. He can't miss heaven. Now, see, 
I tell you that to tell you this. God will use anybody who's willing to be used. You don't have to stand behind this thing, wear one of these things, be in front of a camera. People ask me, go, would you pray that I get to do what you do? I'm like, are you silly? You have no idea. If I told you right now what I'm going through this morning, just right now, as I'm speaking, it's happening. If I told you what was going on, you would say to me, there's no way you can function. There's no way you can be here. Well, why didn't you cancel the date? Because my word was on the line. I wasn't gonna cancel this morning. But my family needs me more right in this moment than they've ever needed me. And as soon as I'm through here, I'm right back to them. Oh, what's going on? I don't know. It's fine. God's got it all worked out. But I don't, you don't know what I'm going through, but conversely, I don't know what you're going through. That many people at the altar, before a message is even shared, tells me one thing. We all need Jesus, don't we? We all need the healing power of God, whether that's physically, emotionally, financially. But here's, where we, here's my message to you today. You may have picked up on it a little bit in the altar. The power of your words. Let's talk about that for a minute. You know, that, you know in, in, um, in 2 Kings, you know the Shunammite woman, right? When you speak as much as I speak, especially right now, I'm not doing this just... I'm thirsty. I'm, my voice has a tendency to try to, well, it's just healed. Let's just say that. She and my woman says to her husband, we have this prophet named Elisha. He comes through here a lot. Let's, let's put a room upstairs. Let's put a bed in there, a table and a lamp. Let's do something for the, for the man of God. So they do this and Elisha comes through and Elisha recognizes, oh, they've done something really kind for me. So he, he says to his servant, Gazi, he goes, what can we do for this lady and her husband? And Elisha said, should, we bring, should I bring you before the king? Which tells you kings have access to priests and priests have access to kings. She says, no, we stay with our own people. And then Gehazi said, well, they don't have any children. And, and Elisha said, about this time next year, you'll be holding a son. Now, the Bible is very clear. She was much older in life, should not be having children, right? What was her response? Don't you mess with me, man of God. Don't you tell me something that's not going to happen. He said, no, it'll happen. And if you keep reading, you'll see that sure enough, it had to be several years later because now the child that she did have is out working in the field with his dad, right? And it says, talks about how his head was hurting, it was hot. I think he had a heat stroke. And what does every good father do when their child gets to not feeling great? Take him to his mom. Because <laughs> moms have an anointing just to take, make everything better. When I was four and a half years old, my mother abandoned me emotionally. I lived a long time wondering, what did I do wrong? Hurting people hurt people. But healed people help people get healed. Six months before my mom went to heaven, the Lord said to me, I want you to walk her through this journey. And you have to understand, when I was 21, my, I heard the Lord say to me, call mom. I heard his audible voice. And when I did, she was attempting suicide. I got her to a hospital, and God saved her life that day. But my mom and I never had a really great relationship and I didn't want to be the one walking her through that process of going from this life to the next. But I know the power of obedience. And near her death, she looked at me one day. She says, I need to ask you to forgive me. I said, okay, I will. And I said, Mom, I want you to forgive me because I haven't been perfect in this relationship. I've done things I shouldn't, shouldn't have done. said, I, I apologize to you. On March 13th, 2020, at 11.32 in the morning, we were in her bedroom. We were singing this song, I Can Only Imagine. And 11.34, she took her last breath, and the Holy Spirit said to me, she no longer has to imagine she's here. Then the Lord had the audacity to say to me, I want you to do her service. He said, it'll be healing to your heart. I did, it was. So this lady gets her sick son, and what does she do with him? She takes him upstairs, because now the child, the Bible says there's no life left in him. Instead of just going into a complete place of grief, she walks that child upstairs into the prophet's room, the seed that she and her husband had sown, placed him on the bed of the prophet, came downstairs, said to her husband, give me something to ride, give me somebody to go with me. And his, her husband said, why are you going to the prophet? It's not yet the right season or the timing. And what was her response with three words? It is well. The child is dead. Ladies and gentlemen, my question to you this morning in Clinton, Tennessee is what's dead in your life that you don't need to agree that it's dead, you need to speak life to it. 
She tells the guy going with her, unless I tell you to slow down, don't slow down. Let's go. Elisha sees from a distance. There's, there's the Shunammite woman, sends a servant, goes down to her. And as Elisha comes up and the servant and, and the woman are talking, the woman lunges toward him and grabs hold of his legs. In a, most churches today, if you grab hold of the preacher's leg, you're going to have six security guys take you off and physically throw you out the door, right? Okay, let me just get on a little soapbox just for a minute here. I was at Daystar, that's as far as I'll go, I'll do a TV there, and I walked into the green, they're always, they're called green rooms. I don't know why, they're never green, but they're all, it's the hospitality room. I walked in, I sit down, I, I had, I don't know, I had somebody with me, but they, I was by myself sitting in this chair, and somebody that you would know walked in, and somebody with this well-known minister had his coat in one hand, another guy was walking with his coffee in another hand, the, the main minister walked right past me, didn't say hi, anything, just kept going, and I thought, okay, this is how this is going to be. We go out there, and this is when Marcus was alive, and Marcus changed their, just all of a sudden changed the rotation. He said, Dean, I want Dean to go first today, so they put me on first. And this minister who had blown right past me, had not spoken to me, you know, it didn't even acknowledge I existed, sent one of his guys over and said, so-and-so really would like to meet you. He wants you to do something. And I'm like, I got to go. Because if you can't speak to someone when you walk in the room, you're not qualified to talk to somebody afterwards just because you see their gift. What's my point? In ministry and in life, there are no big eyes and there are no little U's. We all have a part to play. And what we all do makes the kingdom of God work. The eye can't say to the ear, I have no need of you. The hand can't say to the foot, I can't say to you, I don't. Listen, people ask me, they go, well, we, we, we partner with your ministry, Dean, but we don't ever get to go with you. I'm like, are you crazy? You go with me every time I go. I carry you here. You share in all the results of all these people's lives being impacted. I say that to you because while Gehazi is pulling the lady off of the legs of Elisha, Elisha says, wait a minute, I didn't, something's wrong. But what was his question? Is it well? He picked up on something. Is it well? She had just told her husband, it is well. All is well. And Elisha said, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your son? She says, it is well. Is she lying? He's dead. No, she's calling those things that be not as though they already were. Sometimes you and I have to just look into the future and bring it into the now. That's why the Bible says now faith is now. Now faith is. If it's not now, it's not faith. It's hope, which is important because hope gives faith something to hang on to. But if all you're doing is hoping, well, I sure hope this happens. You're not in faith. It's probably not going to happen. Nothing's going to move until you open your mouth and begin to say, Father, your word says, dun, 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 dun. They get back to the house. He sends, Elisha sends Gehazi ahead of him, put my staff on the little boy. Elisha gets there, goes upstairs, keeps everybody downstairs, shuts the door, prays, does what God tells him to do, comes back downstairs, goes back upstairs, prays, that's what God tells him to do. And suddenly the Bible says the body of the little boy begins to get warm. Why is it warm? Blood is flowing. The heart is pumping. The child has come back. I tell you that to tell you this. Had that lady, that Shunammite woman, had she agreed with her circumstances today in 2023, we would not be talking about her life. Now, my question is this. What did that little boy, what was the potential God put on that child's life that the enemy tried to take him out at such a young age? You've been through some stuff, ladies, gentlemen? Here's the question. What does the devil know about your future that he's so petrified you're going to get there that he's done everything he can to steal, kill, and destroy from you? What's he know? Because you see, until you agree with the word, you're just a sitting duck with a big target on your life. You're looking at somebody in my airplane. I lost an engine at 15,000 feet in flight. Yeah. If you don't pray in tongues, come fly with me. You will. <laughs> Ten, we did an emergency landing that night in, over in West Virginia at a runway that was 75% surrounded by mountains. And I was, I was on a ministry trip. Landed, my wife said, oh, you've, you've gotten there fat. You must have had a tailwind. I said, no, nope, we did an emergency landing. What happened? I told her. Got home the next day. Ten days later, I leased an airplane. Was speaking somewhere in, out in the Chicago area. Got to the airplane the next morning. You couldn't see 10 feet in front of you. One of the tires was low, and I had an internal witness. Don't get on the airplane. I ignored all three, proving stupid was a real word. Got on the airplane, prayed, took off, and lost the left engine on takeoff. I lost two airplane engines in 10 days on two different airplanes. It's unheard of. And I had well-meaning Christians in churches all over the place say to me, well, brother, 
God's trying to get you out of aviation. To which I would say, stupid is a very real word. Get away from me. Remember, I'm not a pastor. And they would go, what do you mean? I go, do you love your children? Yes. Would you put them in an airplane at 15,000 feet, kill the engine? They go, okay, let's see what kind of faith you have. They go, no. Well, neither would God. When you go through something, when you go through something, know the origin of what you're going through. Is this from God or the devil? Here's a fail-proof way to know it. Good God, bad devil. So when you and I are going through something, when I went through those loss of engines, I didn't have time to go back and go, well, Lord, somewhere in your Bible here, it tells me I'm not going to die tonight. I had to get aggressive. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. Take what? Take the word and go to work. You know, when, when Jesus was here, give me four or five minutes and I'll wrap up. When Jesus was here, he was not here as Jesus, the son of God, correct? You do know that. Read your Bible. Okay, let's just, I'll prove it to you. What does the word say? He humbled himself, put deity aside, and came to the earth in the form of a man. When the angel went to Gabriel and said, your prayer has been heard, you're going to have a son, what did, what, what did Zechariah say? How can this be? I'm old. What did the angel do? You're not going to talk again. Why did he say that? Because he knew the word would talk John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. He wouldn't show up. God can only move when the word is spoken. Anything God's ever going to do for you, he's already done. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. Not because he, he was finished. When God rested on the seventh day, he wasn't tired. He's God. He was through. So when Jesus comes as Jesus, the son of man, we see him at birth. By the way, what did the wise men bring him? Gold, frankincense, myrrh. Do you realize Jesus never received an offering in his entire ministry? It's not there. But yet he had a staff of 12 and, somebody, and one of those 12 was stealing from him. Jesus was loaded. He became poor so that we could become rich. You don't become something you already are. Where did the money come from to fund his ministry? Where do you think all that money went that he got as a child at birth? His parents had to steward that money, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We see him at birth. We see him again at 12. Where is he at 12? He's in church teaching teachers. His mom and dad go, where is Jesus? We haven't seen him in three days. We better go back to go back. To, what are you doing here? What was his response? Did you not know? I must be about my father's business. We see him again 18 years later at 30. So at birth, we see him. At 12, we see him. We don't see him again until he's 30. What is he doing all those years? He's Luke 252 ing He's growing in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. And at 30, John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God, the Son of God. There he is. And because the day previous, the Spirit of God said to him, upon whom you see the Spirit of God resting on him in the form of a, of a dove. I wrote a book, part of this, in one of the chapters about the Holy Spirit. He's not a bird. We need to understand that. The Holy Ghost is not a bird. And you would surprise you if you to think about, well, he came, he's a bird. No, he's not. He came in the form of a bird. The Holy Ghost is here. I do not have a bird fluttering inside of me. I have the power of God. And so do you. Upon whom you see him. And Jesus is baptized. And out he, out he comes out of the, from the water. What is this loud, booming voice Say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What does the word say? It is impossible to please God without faith. Could God have been saying, this is my beloved son in whom there is great faith? But yet he had done nothing supernatural yet. Jesus, we see in Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24. You back up to, we all know that. That's the hallmark of faith. But if you go back to about verse 12, you'll see where it says, Jesus was, and Jesus was hungry. And looking afar off, he saw a fig tree. And he said, I wonder if there's any, any, any fruit on that tree. Jesus knew there was no fruit. And they got up there, and, and there, was no, there was just leaves. And I was studying this earlier this year, and the Lord said to me, he said, when you go into churches, I want you to tell them this. On that fig tree were only leaves. There was no fruit. He said, it's no different in today's church. Many churches have lots of leaves, which is activity, but very little fruit. Yeah, I'm coming back for the fruit. So Jesus says, you'll never eat, you'll never produce fruit again. And the Bible said a very interesting sentence next. It says, and his disciples heard it. They go to Jerusalem. Jesus clears out the temple. They come back the next day. And Peter, had to be Peter, goes, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed, it's withered up. And then Jesus' next response was this, have faith in God. Have the God kind of faith. 
have God's faith. Then he tells you what that is. If you will but speak to that mountain and say to it, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and do not doubt in your heart, but believe those things that you say, you will have whatsoever things you say. It says to believe it once and to say it three times. Words create, my friends. Peter was asked this question. Jesus looked at his disciples and says, who do men say that I am? Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say, but Jesus then looked at his 12 and he goes, well, who do you say that I am? Peter jumps up and goes, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus' response, Simon Peter, you are correct. Flesh and blood did not re reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven, and you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. What's the point? You'll never know who you are until you know who he is. And you'll never know what you're called to do until you discover in him that you have a calling. Romans says it this way, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, they are without repentance. Gifts in that sentence are plural, calling is singular. When you're in your one singular calling, everything God's called you to do will work through those giftings. I will tell you this in closing. I usually have three closing. I think I'm up to number two, so we're getting close now. In the day in which we're living, you can't play church. Faith is not something that we just talk about and sing about and Faith is a weapon, and it's designed by God to be used to invoke his word. His word will not return void. It doesn't matter. I tell teenagers, they tell them, you know, one of the reasons God really blesses what we do in schools is because, thank you, Joseph, because I never walk in with a speech. I mean, today I probably have given you at least six different messages, and who knows if it made sense, but I just, I heard it, I said it. And I have, I have this deal with God. I'm like, if you'll tell me what to say, I'll say it. And no matter what it looks like or sounds like, I'll just do it. You know what? Young people don't care how much you know until you, they understand how much you know about them. Teenagers tell me all the time, you know why I talk to you? Because you seem to really care. It's not that teenagers want to talk. It's that they need to be heard. If you have young people in your life, if you're a parent or a grandparent, let me help you with something. The, every day in America, 5,600 teenagers attempt suicide. The UTC arena that feeds 12,000 in Chattanooga would fill up every two and a half days with teenagers who in the previous 60 hours bought the lie. The average teenager spends nine hours a day on his or her phone. Doing what? If you have a young person in your life and, and you go, well, hey, how's it going? They go, everything's great. And all you ever hear is everything's great. You better start looking. It's not. I know what I'm talking about. Doctors know medicine, attorneys know the law, construction people know how to build. I know teenagers. I've invested the last 31 years, nine months, or 11 months and five days into reaching them. I'm gonna reach thousands in the next couple of days for one reason, they're our future. Find yourself in scripture and verse, even whether you're the youngest or the oldest. I'm called to Ezekiel 3, 10 and 11. I have a mandate of Proverbs 24, 11, a message of Job 33, 4, off with the purpose of 2 Timothy 4 or 5. I know why I'm standing here. And God doesn't love me more than he loves you. Joseph, what do we have in the back there today? Please, sir. On our table, we have some resources, not a lot, because we I think we basically almost sold out. This is a new T-shirt. It just says, you matter. Our campaign in high schools is called, you matter. Uh, everywhere we go, we tell teenagers that they matter. These are how much? I have no idea. $15. I've never back there, so I don't know what happens back there. This is my devotional book I wrote. It's for teenagers, but it's, a lot of adults get it, especially on our television broadcast. This devotional book I wrote in 112 days during the busiest season to that point in the life of our ministry, and there were 365 daily devotions. I tell teenagers, if you get into this book, you'll get into the book, because in the book are the answers. If you happen to like how I speak, you'll like how I write. It's very casual. This is my accepted books, just accepted my journey. One of my closest friends is a guy named John Bevere. Um, he wrote the foreword for me, Kenneth Copeland, Jesse Duplantis. I mean, there's 13 different endorsements on this book. This is my life story to this point. And a lot of people get this because they can relate. I was sexually abused at 15. I, I, I had an encounter with God at 21. I have gone through some pretty heavy stuff in my life. And I'll tell you the story in detail. Um, there's that. And then... 
The most important thing on our table is this little bracelet. It just says, youmatter.us. That's where all of our free resources are for follow-up, because I believe in follow-up. There's also a scripture, Job 33, 4, that says, the Spirit of God made you, and the breath of the Almighty gave you life. Teenagers ask me every day, why do you say I matter so much? Because God gave you his breath. You matter for one reason, you're breathing. Jesus, John 17, 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. When Jesus finished, he split. For every $5 that you leave on our table, take a bracelet and give it to a teenager and go, hey, I don't know you, but guess what? You matter. I get pictures of kids wearing these things from all over. So, Pastor, thank you for letting me come into your church. Thank you for letting me be a small part of your day. Congratulations on the anniversary that's upcoming. I'm glad I got to see you. If you're interested in our stuff, we'll be in the back. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.